All right then, moving on in chapter 7, we're going to look at plain strain now in section 7.7. .7. So reviewing uh, with plain stress, we said that in plain stress, it's two-dimensional stress. We have stress in X and Y. We have strain, unfortunately, in all three dimensions. We have strain in X, strain in Y, and strain in Z. Uh, because there is no restraint to move in the Z direction, there's no forces, no stresses in the Z direction, but we still can have deformation or strain, and the thickness changes. Plain strain, on the other hand, is kind of the opposite. In this case, there is something restricting the movement in the Z direction. Some Something. It's either glued to two pieces to keep it from moving, or uh, some other force that's causing uh, movement to be unable to occur in the, z, in the z direction as you're stressing it in x and y. In that case, your strain is zero, but the stresses are not zero. So in that way, it's a little bit of the opposite. Uh, if you look at the stress element or any kind of a piece of it, we're saying that in this case, in plain strain, the thickness is going to remain constant, and we're going to restrict it to keep it from moving by having some stress on the z axis. So we have sigma z in this case are going to be uh, are going to occur, but the thickness is going to change uh, is going to be the same. So just like before, we may have some sigma in the x and y and we may have some shear, some tau in x and y, but the thickness remains constant, therefore the strain in z is zero. All right. Now, generally, the um, plane stress and plane strain do not exist together um, because in one case you're restricting it and the other cases you're not, so there's generally not any cases where they occur together. They'll have to be handled separately. Um, and here is just a little matrix of the, the how the stresses could relate uh, to the different the different stresses in X, Y, and Z, and the strains in X, Y, and Z, and then the shear uh, relate to the uh, these two scenarios. Uh, so in other words, in plain stress, we'd have no stress in the Z, but in plain strain, we have no deformation in Z. But we do have stress in Z. In both cases, we may have shear in the front face and XY face, but we have no shear on the XZ or YZ faces. All right, so just a little review again. Uh, the only way to have stress is to have some sort of force, and we had some force pulling on this object and going uh, in one direction, so we know that we had strain um, in all three directions, but we only had stress in the x direction. There's no stress in the y direction unless there's some force in the y direction. Same with this. We'll have deformation, but no but no stress. The same thing is with, uh, with shear. The only way to have gamma, which is the shear strain, is to have some tau, or some shear forces, some shear stresses, uh, Causing that, you can't have tau, can't have tau, you can't have gamma unless you have some tau. I know we talked about that a little bit before. All right. Now here's a, an element under stress, and we know that if uh, the stresses act alone, uh, then you have uh, then Hooke's law in that direction applies, and if stresses act alone, then Hooke's law in that direction applies. So those make sense. Um, we will get strain if we have stress in one direction. However, if um, uh, if you have multiple stresses um, and uh, and also stress strain in the stress in the z direction, uh, then the following plane strain plane strain transformation equations apply. And these were developed in the book, and so they're repeated for you here. And so here is a way to to um, in plane strain to um, uh, to predict what the, the strain will be in the x and in the y direction. And again, strain in z is equal to zero. And we'll have some, um, some uh, shear strain as well on a particular axis. Okay? And we may also, so these are all x1, y1, those are all at some angle that we may want to compute. Um, uh, we, can, we can find out x... Uh, in the primary axes by using the Hooke's Law equations that we talked about before. But if we want to know the strain in a, some odd angle, then uh, we would do this. And again, we just like we had with principal stresses, we, have, we will find uh, principal strains as well. And they're, they're computed by this 
equation and there's a maximum shear strain. Now these look very, very similar to principal and maximum stresses that we developed early in chapter seven, but we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so here I want to walk through uh, a couple of problems with you. Uh, this is the first one in, in section 7.7. Seven. This is a plate that has um, st um, some stress on in X and Y. There's no shear here. Um, and it says that the strain in the X direction is given as 285 e to the minus 6. So in this direction, 285 e to the minus 6, and strain in the Y direction is negative 190. So clearly the strain is negative, so it says that this is uh, shrinking in the Y and expanding in the X. Um, and what we're looking for here is the increase in the length of this diagonal. So there's a diagonal that goes from here to here, and we're looking for the length, and that diagonal is changing shape. Clearly the, um, the sample is changing shape, and we're looking for this change in angle. All right, so first of all, let's compute the angle. Uh, here I did that to say that this is 2.5 over 7.5, and we see that phi is equal to 18.42. And the uh, strain in this direction, the strain along this axis is given by the strain transformation equations. And that is given by E uh, epsilon x1 is equal to epsilon OD on that line. And the strain transformation equation was given uh, in the previous um, page. Epsilon x plus epsilon y over 2, and you can just keep on going plus that term, plus that term. Now, here's a thing to note. Gamma xy. So that's gamma in this face. So we would be looking for some gamma like this. However, remember, gamma can only be caused by a shear or a tau. There's no tau here. So therefore, this term goes to zero. And that's kind of an important understanding of when you can make things uh, simpler. So with that, I can just plug that straight into there, and I can compute the strain in this on, along this line is equal to 0 0.0002375. And we know that the change in length is equal to the original length times that strain, and so that comes out to 0 0.0018776 inches. So pretty simple there. Now, what's our new angle? Well, a couple ways you can do that, but I, I kind of like computing the new dimensions and then computing the new angle with the tangent function. So the new dimension in y is equal to the original length minus the change in length. Because we know that that one is shrinking because the strain was negative. It was given there. Ey is negative 190. And so that change makes our new length is 2.4995. In the x direction, our new length is beginning 7.5 plus the change in length, 7.5, and then with the tangent function, I can get uh, the change in angle. All right, so, and that's in, I, I computed it in degrees. Uh, our original angle was 18.420, and I new angle is 18.426. Ah, so this is kind of an interesting, again, observation. The new angle is larger than the old angle. And I don't know if that feels obvious to you or not, but it's it's stretching in the x and shrinking in the y. Um, but the new angle is 18.426, meaning it got a little bit bigger. And so our change in angle is 0 0.008 degrees or 1.42 uh, e to the minus 4 radians. All right. I think that makes some sense. All right, so this next problem, um, the first one that we just did had no shear. This one does have shear. And uh, it is given is that the shear in the X and Y uh, dimension is 150, and we got uh, strain. Now, I beg your pardon, this isn't, this isn't shear. This is, the, uh, this is the shear strain, not the shear stress. So these uh, are given by virtue of some measurement. And now we're wanting to find out what the um, what the 
the strain is at an angle of 35. So this is actually quite a simple problem. Just plug all these things into this equation and uh, if we know the strain in XY, the shear strain in XY as well as the normal strain in XY, it's a, it's a simple one equation kind of solution. And it says that along an angle of 35 degrees, so assume that there's some 35 degree angle and you're going to get some um, some strain in this direction. So there's some delta uh, e x1 y1 or x1 kind of something or epsilon x1 kind of like that. All right, and then what else is it asking for? Um, uh, we're looking for the change in the length. It says calculate the strains. The strains. Oh, I guess I calculated the um, all of the strains. So in other words, we have some uh, some strain along that axis. Um, that's the x1 axis. We're going to have some some strain in the y1 axis. Epsilon, here I better write it over here, epsilon y1. It's going in that direction. And I computed that using that equation from our transformation equations. And then there's also some shear strain that's uh, calculated from that equation from the transformation equations. All right, so those are pretty simple. Um, what do they mean? We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Um, here's a here's another problem which is uh, kind of interesting. Um, in this case, we have some um, we have this sample that's got a a strain gauge on it, and we're able to measure the strain in this direction only, only in that direction. But let's look at the problem here. It says that uh, it's a brass plate. It's got a modulus of elasticity and Poisson's ratio there. It's located in, or it's loaded in biaxial stress by normal stress, sigma x, and sigma y. It says that sigma x is 10,700, but it doesn't give me sigma y in the problem. So it looks like I'm going to have to try to find that in order to find out what the, uh, the answer to my problem. So a strain gauge is bonded at 35 degrees. So phi here is 35 degrees. And we are looking for the maximum in-plane shear stress, tau max. So again, maximum in-plane shear stress is going to be at the top of Moore's circle, isn't it? We're going to find out, if we find out the principal stresses, then we go draw the Moore's circle and we find out the, the maximum shear stress is going to be at the top and the bottom of Moore's circle. Um, and we also want the shear strain, which is given easily once you find the shear stress. That's that relationship of sigma or gamma is equal to tau over g. All right, so let's find that, and then we're going to find the maximum shear strain uh, uh, sigma in the y and the xz plane. Actually, I didn't do that. I don't care about that so much. All right, so what do we know? Um, we know that sigma x is equal to p uh, over a in that direction. Sigma y is py over that direction. Um, uh, that's the only way to have some some stresses. So we know that there is some, uh, but we don't we don't know for sure that there's there's sigma y. It could end up being zero, but we'll find out by plugging things into the equations and find out. And the, again, there's no shear here, so there's no shear stresses and uh, and no shear deformation, uh, no gamma in on that face. So, all right. So from the Hooke's law equations, we can say that the uh, strain in the x direction is equal is related to the stresses in x and y. The strain in the y direction is related to the stresses in the y. And then from the plane strain equation, where we're combining the two pieces here, we say that the strain in the x1 direction, which is along this line, is uh, is given by uh, by these guys. Now again. Um, we have to know sigma x, which is right there, or not sigma, but epsilon x and epsilon y, which are coming from Hooke's law. And we know the cosine 2 theta because that's the, the 35 degrees. This one, again, goes to zero because we don't have any shear strain. So that means uh, there's no shear stresses shown, so therefore we have no shear strain in that face. All right, so we set this up as a three equations, three unknowns situation. And I did it like this. I said that x is equal to my um, sigma x, y is equal to my, uh, I beg your pardon, uh, x is equal to my epsilon x. That's what I'm looking for. y is equal to my epsilon y, and s is equal to my 
sigma in the y direction, shear in the y direction. I had to use um, x, y, and s because I plugged this into my calculator and I wanted to show you how I did that. Um, this is uh, my droid tablet, which you've seen before. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. This is a, this is a program called HandyCalc. And if I can go this way, you can see how I plug those uh, equations in and solve for those three in one swoop. And again, you can probably do this on your 89 just fine. Um, I like uh, uh, learning new tools, and so that's why I did this on my calculator or on my tablet. And what I got here is that uh, X and Y and S are equal to those values. And again, this is the epsilon X, epsilon Y, and stress in the Y direction, S and the sigma Y. All right, so I plugged those together, and I got three equations, three unknowns, and that's pretty much the end of the problem. Uh, what I was looking for was uh, the maximum stress in the X, Z plane. But if I know... I have to, this is what I was looking for is the sigma and the y because sigma x was given, sigma x was given as, where are we, 10,700, given up there, where are we, 10,700. So if I know sigma x and sigma y, then from Mohr's circle, if I just draw the Mohr's circle, I can do, you know, sigma x and sigma y, take the average of it there and find out what that is, and those are my, uh, that's my tau max, and you remember how to do all that. I don't actually have to find the principal axes because I can take the average of sigma x and sigma y, divide that by 2, and that's always going to be the top and bottom of Mohr's circle. So let me erase that because I don't want to clutter up my paper. But anyway, that's uh, something that you should be able to kind of, uh, kind of remember how to find the maximum, um, maximum shear stress by knowing sigma x and sigma y, even without going through the whole Mohr's circle exercise. All right, from there, we can also find some stresses if we want. And uh, where did I do that? Did I do that? Actually, I did that on a different problem. So I guess, uh, yeah, okay, I can, I can show you one more problem. Um, so anyway, what does it mean? Um, working backwards, uh, most of the time, we don't know what the stress is until we measure some strain. Uh, we've talked about that. So we use strain gauges to measure strain in X and Y and theta. So there's two real common configurations of strain gauges. One, this is called the 45 degree strain rosette, and this is a 60 degree rosette. Um, but in general, what you do is you measure the strain and equate them to sigma or uh, uh, epsilon X, epsilon Y, and uh, and um, and epsilon along the other axis. Then we use Hooke's law equations to, uh, uh, and the and, um, uh, on the other equations, uh, the strain transformation equations. And we usually get multiple equations, multiple unknowns that have to be solved simultaneously. And then we can find out uh, how stresses and strains relate. Once we do that, we can actually work backwards. And also, once you find the stresses. Uh, Hooke's law equations find the stresses, then we can use force stress relationships to find the actual loads. And that's why I was so interested in having you guys do the uh, stress element given the load. Now we're going to take the stress element and go backward. Remember we did the, the, the bars and stuff like that. Given the forces, let's find the stress element. If we can find the stress element using all this stuff, this is, this is the stress element right here. Now we can work backwards to find the force stress relationships to find the actual loads. And the last problem I want to go through here with you is this uh, 7, 7 15, 15 where this is a uh, situation where we have strain gauges in three orientations in the X direction and the Y direction and at a 45 degree angle. And it says this is a test of an airplane wing uh, and it's given the strains uh, in the X direction, E or epsilon X, epsilon Y, and epsilon at the 45 degrees. All right, now. Just a reminder, again, be, because we have multiple strains, um, we know that it is not so simple to say that sigma x is equal to E epsilon x and sigma y is not equal to E epsilon y. Yeah, we have to use the strain transformation equations in order to figure out what uh, the actual um, stresses are, uh, so we can't quite get there like that. All right, so the question is asking, determine the principal strains and maximum shear strains. Um, all right, so we'll use the strain transformation equations. In this case, um, uh, 
epsilon x1 will be epsilon along the 45 degree angle and that's given as epsilon x plus y plus that plus the cosine 2 theta because the gamma 2 theta or gamma sine 2 theta. Now just to note when you have a 45 degree angle cosine of 2 times 45 is equal to cosine of 90 which is 0 so this term goes away when you have that 45 degree angle and uh, the sine of 2 theta sine of 90 degrees is 1 so we can we can uh, go real fast to get to gamma in the xy in the xy uh, orientation um, if we have strain in the if we have strain along that axis that means we have gamma which means we have shear stress uh, in the xy orientation so i can find out gamma xy uh, real fast using that equation we can find the principal axes uh, again quite simply by using the principal axis equations and i get these which are the uh, equations that it was looking for now what I was kind of thought was curious is let's find what the stresses are. Uh, we started off saying we know we don't know what the stresses are. We can't find those stresses, so let's let's find out what the stresses are given our strains. So I, I've got a strain in the x. I got a strain in the y. Um, can I find those stresses using Hooke's law equations? And the answer is yes. So let's let's. Pretend that we know what material it is. Uh, since the uh, oops, since the material was not given in the problem, I just said let's 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 uh, say that it's aluminum with an e of uh, 10 uh, million, 10 e to the six, and a g of 3.8 e to the six, and a nu of 0.33, which I got out of the back of the book. And now I can use the Hooke's law equations and find out what my sigma is because I have strain in x and y now, and I know what that is. I can find that real easily, and I can find sigma x and sigma y. Tau xy, here's where I have to find out what this shear is, and this is where I needed to know the gamma xy in order to find out what my shear xy is, but that's given quite easily by this equation, by the relationship of Hooke's law, and I can say that gamma, uh, tau xy, the shear xy, is equal to the gamma xy times g, and I can find out that it's 2488 psi. Now I can draw the stress element, uh, which is where we've been starting uh, many of our problems up until today, is uh, the stress element looks like this. I got 55, 39 in tension in the x, 1027 tension in the y, and I got a positive shear of 2488. From there, I should be able to go in actually find the forces. If I had a configuration of a, of a, uh, if it was a bar or a, or uh, uh, a, I, I basically I, need, I can't go go find forces yet until I know what areas are or what the or what the shape of the article looks like. But but here I can certainly find the stresses during this during this analysis. All right. So um, with that, then here's the problem I want to give you for homework, and it's it's a it's a good challenging problem. But uh, what it's got here is it's uh, we're given strain gauges in those two axes. And it's given the answers, and what we're trying to find at the end is uh, is P and that torque. So um, I'm going to give that to you for homework. Give that a, a shot using the transformation equations, and see if you can walk backwards from strain to stress to force. All right. Good luck.